Um, I know that sometimes uh, for each of us, it, it means dashing in and <laughs> finding the link and, and sitting down and collecting yourself. But I'm, I'm very much glad that you're all here. And I imagine that we'll have a few, few more people joining us as we go. Um, so given that we're not too big of a group, maybe we can just do a quick go around and uh, share your name, where you're from, and maybe if you already have an EV, uh, what you have. If you don't have an EV, but you're a curious potential buyer, let us know that too. Um, so I'll start out, and my name is Janelle Piotter, and I'm the volunteer coordinator for New Paltz Climate Smart. I live in New Paltz, and I have a Chevrolet Bolt. Uh, bolt with a B is uh, fully electric and absolutely love it. I <laughs> have had it for a couple of years now. Uh, who would like to go next? Oh. Janelle, I think you just have to ask people to go. I think I will. <laughs> um, on, on that note, Samrat, would you like to go next? <laughs> um, hi, I'm Samrat. Um, uh, I'm a member of the New Paltz Climate Action Coalition. Uh, and uh, I teach at a high school, I teach physics and mathematics, and uh, we have, I have a Tesla Model 3, and my partner has a Nissan Leaf, both are all electrics. Thank you. Uh, Sue. Would you Hi, like I'm Sue, I'm in New Paltz, and I'm looking to buy, make my next car electric. <laughs> Excellent, you're in the right place. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> uh, Ron, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'll have to uh, get it together to uh, We can hear you, but you're breaking up a little bit, so you can pop that into the app. Yeah, yes. So, Ron from the column, and uh, next car will be electric, but next my conclusion is waiting here. All right. Well, you'll let us uh, pop any questions into the chat. Uh, Mark, Marion. Hi, I'm Mark Varian from Gardner, and through Samarat's prodding, I did get an electric vehicle, the Kona Hyundai, and uh, love it so far. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Aurel. Okay, um, I'm Aurel there from uh, New Paltz, and I've been thinking um, about getting an electric car, but um, I only have a, uh, about 50,000 miles on a Honda and I was wondering whether um, exchanging uh, a car that's going well for an electric car makes sense. Excellent question, one I'm sure others have. We'll, we'll park that question, thank you. Uh, Elaine. Hi, um, I'm Elaine from West Westchester. And uh, we've been thinking about an electric car for a long time, but we, uh, you know, the 19, uh, no, the uh, 2005 Toyota seems to keep going. So uh, we can't really get a new car yet. <laughs> it's always good to be planning for when you need it because then, then you'll know what you're gonna wanna get. <laughs> I am going to be prepared. There's also the auto show in the city in August. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna have a whole section on just electric cars. Excellent. Or electric vehicles. Excellent, well, thank you for mentioning that. And uh, Rick. Yeah, Rick Urizeri <clears throat> from Gardner, a member of the Climate Task Force in Gardner and worked for the uh, New York State Solar Farm I am on the market trying to figure out whether I want an electric uh, vehicle or a hybrid uh, plug-in or something along those lines. So I'm going to put Sam right on the, on the spot tonight and see if he can confuse, confuse me a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Lisa. Hello, everybody. I'm Lisa from New Paltz. Um, I'm an earth science teacher. I drive a Prius. Um, recently, but uh, uh, my husband's been talking with Samrat. Uh, Jonathan has been talking with Samrat um, because we are looking for a second car um, and we're just uh, trying to get as much information as we can. 
Um, so that's why I'm here. Excellent. Thank you for being here. Uh, Tom Conrad. Um, hi, I'm Tom from Stone Ridge. I also spend a lot of time trying to get people in electric vehicles. I just wanted to uh, listen in and get uh, see if Samrat has some takes on it that I don't have. Um, mm -hmm. My wife and I have a 2012 RAV EV and a 2017 Prius Prime plug-in hybrid. Great, thank you for being here. Uh, Jim. Hi, uh, Jim O'Dowd from New Pulse. Um, I have a, a Prius um, and um, you know, somewhere down the line, I'd like to get an electric car. Uh, Simon. Hi, I'm Simon Strauss from Olive and I'm interested to hear what everyone has to say. I am going to be looking for a new car quite soon. Excellent, you're in the right place. Um, do I pronounce your name, uh, Maitreya? Maitreya. Um, so I'm Maitreya. I'm from Rosendale and I'm 15 and cannot drive and don't have much control over my family's financial decisions, but I'd hope to nudge them towards getting an electric car the next time it comes up. Fantastic. We're really glad you're here. <laughs> Janelle, I have to add, Maitreya is a climate reality leader as well. She so Matreya is someone who, who re re really is, is uh, setting an example for young people. Um, Bravo. Bravo. Thank you for that intro. And uh, uh, Keeling? Uh, hi. <clears throat> I'm Eric and this is Joanna. We live in New Paltz most of the time, but we're on sabbatical in California right now. And uh, we know Samrat and we are also interested in, we're interested in getting an electric guitar, like I always say electric guitar. Every time I say electric car, I say electric guitar, because I'm a guitar player. Um, I already have an electric guitar, uh, but an electric car, yes. Excellent. And uh, uh, if everybody can mute yourself unless you're speaking, that's very helpful. Um, best guess, Rick. Oh, hi. <laughs> I'm Rick. I live in Highland, and I uh, have my doubts about an EV, so I'm here to learn more. Okay, well, I'm glad you came, and uh, we're very much open to your challenging questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> in fact, um, if anybody's more comfortable throwing those into the chat, that's perfectly um, helpful, helpful to, to Samrat, too, to kind of see what the range of questions are and uh, to be able to um, try to address them. And we certainly are gonna have a plenty of time just for open discussion too. Um, that's always, you know, so, sometimes even the more powerful part of the whole meetup is just the open conversations that we have. So um, I would like to um, begin by just welcoming uh, Samrat. Uh, so much gratitude that, that you're willing to present tonight and just talk about your experience with electric cars. I, I, I can't think of a person who I could describe more as an EV enthusiast as uh, Samrat. And um, I think we'll let him tell you more, but he is a high school teacher in the area. And given that the school year is just over, I I'm, have gratitude that you <laughs> have chose to come on a Zoom because um, Teachers uh, need a recovery period after the school year, I think. So thank you for being here, Samrat. Thanks, Chanel. Um, uh, everyone, uh, I'm so glad that you're all here. It's a nice, nice group, uh, but I'm always happy to talk to anyone, like even a, an audience of one person about electric cars. So if you know anyone who's not here and would like, has, has doubts, uh, has questions, uh, I'll share my info at the end. I'd love to talk to them. Um, so could you, I mean, I see, I, I, I Aurel had a question and I actually want to begin with that question, but if you have any other questions, please feel free to put them in the chat because I don't want to do a traditional presentation. I mean, I could go bring out my PowerPoint and go for 20 minutes. I could do that, but, um, I would rather this be a conversation where I answer most of your, uh, whatever things you have as, as like more in a conversational format while sharing. Uh, facts. Uh, so just feel feel free to put things in the chat. Um, I'd like to start off by just giving you a quick background 
uh, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully Janelle, I'm allowed to share my screen. I'll try that. Nope. Uh, could you make me co-host please? You should be able to share your screen now. Try it again. Okay. Yes, that's good. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to give you quick background into like, this is my, my life, my childhood. So I grew up in Northern India, right uh, near the capital Delhi. Uh, and my dad uh, and my, my mom and dad are both chemists. My mother was a teacher and my dad worked for India's largest oil refinery at that time. It's India's largest public sector oil corporation. It's called Indian oil. And that's me and my brother. And that's my dad and my mom in the late eighties there. And that's the refinery that we, we grew up in the shadow of that refinery. And uh, this was our life. We never thought uh, that there was anything wrong with this way of living. Like it just was, that's how we lived. And people talked about uh, conservation. And that was the big thing that we did. Like we would have an oil conservation week once a year. Um, and all, all my education's been sponsored by oil money. Uh, and um, my dad sent me a nice little check to buy a house as well. So some of my the equity in the house will also be from oil money. So I don't, I don't speak from it from perspective. I don't come from a family of hippies. Uh, I, and I'll try to be very pragmatic uh, uh, when we approach this question. So uh, Aurel's question was, and I think that's a great point to be, place to begin because I, I hear that a few of you are in that position right now where, people's, where people have a car and the car's fine. And then the question is, should I buy a car? Like, isn't, some people will say, isn't that the worst thing to do environmentally? So the first thing I'll say to that is that uh, your car is not going to be thrown into a garbage dump. It's not going to a landfill. You'll sell that car and somebody's gonna drive that car. And in all likelihood, the person who's gonna drive that car has lesser financial means than you do. If you can think of buying a new car, then you really belong in a certain um, economic class in the US. Most Americans cannot think about buying a new car. The used car market is more than twice the size of the new car market. And I haven't even looked at the latest numbers with where the right now the used car market is just crazy and the prices are high. So if you can think about buying a new car, it means you are in a position of uh, financial privilege that most Americans do not enjoy. So I would really encourage you to sell that car because some college student, uh, maybe someone like Matreya, uh, who's gonna get their first car and they, 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 their parents are not willing to buy them. I'm not saying Matreya, your parents are not willing to buy you, but if they don't have the money, they might be able to enjoy a car that's been well taken, well taken care of. Um, also cars are, and if you're getting, if you're again concerned about the end of the life, cars are actually a very recycled commodity. More, about 75% of the parts in cars period are recycled. Cause it's just like, they go someplace where they wanna pull out as much as they can from cars. So anyhow, your old car, somebody's gonna drive it to the ground and then they're gonna to try to extract as much value from it as possible. So I really put, I would urge you uh, to think about selling your car and the used car market is hot. So even if you were being very pragmatic, you could get a few thousand dollars extra for your car that you might not a few months later. So that's my sales pitch to get rid of your car right now. Um, any questions on that? Anything that uh, you need clarification with? Um, Okay, then I want to show you a photo that I, or, or, or a visual, which you may or may not have seen. Um, this is an explosion that's hap happened in the Caspian Sea, I believe. Yeah, I don't know, a couple of days ago, I, have to, I forget the last few days, there have been a few of these um, oil related explosions, like including the fire in the Gulf of Mexico. This is in the Caspian Sea and I'm starting to get confused about the causes and, and the order uh, of events here. But the one thing that's guaranteed with oil pipelines or, or, or gas pipelines is you're going to have an explosion sometime or the other. It's, it's not 
if, it's a when. So we really need to start thinking in terms of, do we wanna move away from a technology, uh, even if we forgot climate change, it comes uh, with this huge problem of, of, of risk to uh, human life, uh, but look, risk to marine life as well, uh, or, or other life that's around these pipelines. Um, anyhow, so let's see. Um, would you, are people more interested in the environmental aspects? Like, does it make sense to buy an electric car over a hybrid car? Is that a question that some of you might have? Could, would you like me to talk about the does it really make sense environmentally to uh, buy an electric car? Would that be helpful? Okay. Yes, yes please. Okay, all right. So um, let me just, uh, instead of looking at what's happening across the world, I wanna, maybe I'll give you a sense of what's happening across the world a little bit, uh, real quick, to see why the transfer, what, what the transformation that's happening, why is it happening? So, a bunch of countries across the world have, have said that they want to end the internal combustion engine, ban the sale of new gas and diesel powered vehicles, right? Uh, Norway is the, is the leader there. They might even not need to get to the ban because uh, last month, 85% of new car sales in Norway were either plug-in uh, hybrids or all electrics. So Norway is going to beat their deadline easily. But you can see a bunch of other countries there in the US, these bans are starting to come from states, not at the federal level. Um, uh, companies like GM are saying, oh, we're gonna be moving towards an all electric future, uh, forward with the, with the Mustang EV using that iconic name or, or with the Lightning their F-150 all electric. Tesla, of course, uh, having this incredible presence across uh, the US, but also now expanding to other parts of the world, Fremont, Fremont Buffalo, um, Texas, um, and, and Berlin. And this is sort of a chart. This is, this is last year's and this year's numbers are even better, but this chart should give you a sense of what's happening. And I don't wanna get into the numbers specifically, but you can see that if you look at those blue columns, that gives you a sense of how many, uh, What's the electric car market like uh, across the major car markets in the world? Uh, uh, Europe, China, US. Now, the Chinese is the biggest car market in the world. Uh, and uh, I think the Europeans and the US are very close. I don't know exactly who, who is higher there, but you can really see that the US is lagging behind. And, and they, they, they're, they don't have the kind of governmental support that exists in the EU and in China. Again, looking at 2020 numbers, you see that these are the countries with the highest share of new uh, electric sales. And they're all European countries and it's not surprising. By numbers, China might be bigger, I have to check that. Uh, but as a percentage, these countries are much bigger. So the question really is, why are we beginning to see this transformation? Why is this happening, starting to happen across all the major markets in the world? And one of the biggest reason is that transportation is now the major cause of air pollution related death and disease across the world. But I'm gonna look at US numbers specifically. Um, more than 50,000 Americans die prematurely every year. They lose almost a decade of their life due to transportation related pollution. Uh, this, is the, this is from exacerbating existing conditions, but also causing new cases and things that are related to uh, your, your lungs, the heart. This is, this is uh, just tragic, the fact that this is happening at this level and we don't talk about this. Now, who bears the burden of this? I mean, who bears the burden of this? These are people who cannot away, afford to live away from highways, which is again, Again, I want to emphasize this. These are people who cannot afford to live away from highways. These are people who cannot afford to buy electric cars, right? So we, people who have monetary resources, we buy big cars because, oh, we need to, I go with my family to a ski vacation every year. 
I must do that. How, I know I, I got two dogs as well. I'm, I don't do that. I'm just saying those are usually the things that people say that I need to do all of that. Well, yes, you need to do all of that, but somebody else's child's health must not suffer as a consequence of your vacation. So I think there's a moral responsibility here that, that a lot of us ignore very conveniently. And um, that's something we really have to look at when we're talking about why do we need to move towards this? Um, so anyhow, that's, and I, one can always talk more about that uh, burden, health burden, the moral burden there. So number one cause of um, uh, pollution uh, and health related problems uh, due to pollution, and also the number one cause of greenhouse gas emissions in the US. So these are 20, 2017 numbers and you can see how gradually transportation overtook electricity as being the biggest source of greenhouse gases. Um, and the majority of these emissions are coming from driving, right? So 60% of those emissions come from the passenger cars that people have, their SUVs and their pickup trucks. These are the things that people drive again to their vacations, to pick up their children from school. Um, people, lots of people at my workplace drive pickups to work, though their work has nothing to do with picking up anything. Um, anyhow, uh, these are numbers in 2018, the same story. Transportation is the biggest source of greenhouse gases in the US. If you look at New York state, same story. Transportation is again, the biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions followed uh, closely by buildings because of course we burn fossil fuels in buildings uh, to heat ourselves or rather heat our spaces. Um, so then the question really is, are EVs really better for the environment, right? Um, they better be. They better be, otherwise there's no point moving towards EVs. You're just exchanging one evil for the other. Um, so the biggest plus is you got no tailpipe emissions uh, with EVs. Let's assume for a second, this is an assumption, hypothetical, that EVs offered no benefit as far as greenhouse gas emissions are concerned. Yet they would be of incredible benefit to the health of, of folks that live near uh, major highways. You would see an improvement in their children's health. You would see an improvement in their scores on tests because test scores are adversely affected by uh, particulate pollution, right? Because it, particulate pollution affects the development of a child's brain. So in any case, even if we didn't get any greenhouse gas uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, we would see a big reduction in pollution in neighborhoods. And that's not just um, air pollution, it's also sound pollution. We somehow take it for granted the fact that machines are supposed to make noise. No, machines, you can have machines that do not make noise, right? So that's something we must think about, air pollution and sound pollution. So then the question is, okay, that part is settled. What about, um, this is a usual question people say, okay, that's great. You drive an electric car, but where does your electricity come from, right? because uh, that's the fuel for the electric car. So Union of Concerned Scientists has some of the best data on this. I'll share a link with you. You can go explore that later for your own zip code. Here's the summary of their, of, of their work. That electricity as an energy source is cleaner and cheaper than oil. And even when you look in the US at the dirtiest coal dominated grid, EVs still produce less global warming pollution than their conventional counterparts. And that's really a key takeaway. No matter where you are in the country, the EV is doing better than the average vehicle in the fleet. So here's a link. I'll put that in the chat later. I'd really encourage, or maybe let's do that. Let's, let's do that as a quick exercise because I also get tired of hearing my own voice. And sorry if I get emotional about pollution because I, I think I do get emotional about pollution. Um, and the burden we put on uh, people who don't have a voice. Um, so here's a link, please go there, put in your zip code, and that will tell you that if you charge your electric car on the regular grid, then what would be the greenhouse equivalent of that, greenhouse gas equivalent of that. So please play with that, um, choose the car, you may already have that car, um, or that might be the car you're thinking of, and then put it in the chat.
there are prizes for the person who does it first. And there are prizes for the highest number. Clarification, you want the number of uh, grams of CO2 per month? No, no, no. no. We, it should give you, uh, it's basically saying that driving an electric car by charging it on the regular grid is like driving a car that gives you this many miles per gallon. It's comparing the, the greenhouse gas emissions, right? How much would you have to drive an electric car to get the same amount of emissions as a, like a gasoline car? Uh, so I'm, I would, and again, I'm, I'm happy to share my numbers, but I would love to get some numbers from you all. And if anybody needs help with the tool, I'm happy to uh, show how to do that as well. Okay. Okay, 262, Janelle's car. So that's what, what Janelle is saying by 262 is that Janelle's bolt, if it was charged in the grid in New York, in New Falls. Yeah. Um, that's great, Tom. Tom gives me the CO2 per mile. I knew I would get the <laughs> grams of CO2 per mile from Tom. Uh, but Janelle, Janelle 60, 262 means that you would have to drive this car for 262 miles to get the same, right? That, that, that's, that's it's, it's equivalent in terms of um, pollution that you get that if you were to burn one gallon of gas. That's, that's stunning. I, I hope that number makes sense, like, because these are such huge numbers, right? Uh, again, I really want to stress that because this is, this is one of the key takeaways here. I'll share my screen to show, like, if I charge my car from the regular grid, I don't because I'm signed up for community solar, so I'm offsetting all of that. But it would be the same as if for every gallon, I was getting 293 miles. I mean, this is really important, right? Um, it's not possible to make gasoline cars like that. I also want to share. Um, huh, that's interesting, Tom. I'm curious. Um, it should, I mean, it should come up on the top as a line right under the where you choose the different options. Like it, it, I'm sure I'll show you where I'm seeing it, but I wonder if it's a browser thing as well. Like it, it shows up here. If you scroll down too much, then it just, then it gives you the grams. But here it should show. Um, anyhow, so that's a great tool to play with. Of course, most people who buy um, electric cars usually pair it with either solar panels in their house or something like uh, community choice aggregation or community solar. Uh, quick pitch for that. Is everyone signed, is, does everyone have either solar panels or is signed up for uh, a community solar program or not. If you aren't, then Janelle is the person to talk to, <laughs> right? So for us, that number would be zero, zero grams of CO2 for any number of miles we drive, right? That's fantastic. Um, um, okay. Again, I'm also gonna give you some extra information so that you might have friends who are who express doubts about this as well. It's good to be able to speak to other people about this as well. So if you look at, this is again, Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, you can explore their website and their resources. And uh, this is the 2018 map. I believe they have updated this. So what you're looking at is again, doing the same thing across different parts of the, of, of the country. And these are, remember, these are average numbers. So as you can see, New York upstate says 231, but our numbers in New Paul's are much better. So, so it's, it's important to, to see that uh, nuance there. Now, if you were to do just an average, if you look at the, the bottom right here, the average for US EVs is 88 miles per gallon, 88 miles per gallon. That's quite impressive. Why is that so impressive? So now I'm gonna ask you a question. Um, what is the average fuel efficiency for um, fossil fueled cars, for gasoline cars in the US. 
If you look at all the gasoline cars in the US and you calculated their average fuel efficiency, how many miles to the gallon do you think they give? What would your guess be? Okay, Tom Conrad says probably in the low 20s. Okay, 15, 24. 22. 22, Jim says 22. Uh, we have to, one more, one more before we give out the prize. 17, <laughs> iPhone says 17, we cannot send any prizes to iPhone. Uh, that's, you have to be a person to win a prize here. Um, the right answer is 25, about 25. So 24, 25, that's it, right? So just by, move, you can see all, also on the average piece, nationwide too, you see how EVs just decimate um, fossil fuel cars. That's really important to remember. All right, Scott, that was Scott. Um, okay. And if you have questions, please uh, stop me. I'm just gonna, I wanna again emphasize this with another graphic. I'm talking about the same point, but I'm emphasizing this with another graphic. This is the life cycle emissions in New York state of a mid-sized premium fossil fuel car. Why am I using a mid-sized mid premium fossil fuel car? Because then I'm gonna compare it with my Tesla, which is considered a premium. I don't think it's a premium. It only costs you $40,000 to begin. The average price of a car in, uh, in the US is now $36,000, but that's how it's classified. Those are the life cycle emissions in New York state. For a, for a Tesla Model 3, that's for personal use and is solar charged, which mine is. So the, you see how many, it's off by how many factor, factor of three or four there. So it's not, and even if I charged it on the regular grid, even if I could not sign up for community solar, I would see, still see that bigger difference. So, um, sorry, that's really important to, uh, as a takeaway. But additionally, the amount of renewable energy in our grid keeps going up. In 2019, 80% of all new electric capacity was renewable energy. Can you say that, oh, oil is going to get cleaner as a fuel, if you forget, what is that? Is that a euphemism, like euphemisms like clean coal? Like can oil get any cleaner? No, it cannot. But the fuel in our electric cars, electricity can, can get cleaner. And that's what we're seeing is happening. That's the same story in Europe as well. That's uh, their numbers. Let me just make sure. Yeah, that's 2018 numbers. 88% of their new capacity was solar and wind. So, and the US uh, in 2019, I've, as I've already said, it, things were so good, have been so good that uh, I just can't uh, help but share this. This is the Kentucky Coal Mining Museum. I, be, I bet a bunch of you have seen this. Uh, the Coal Mining Museum has solar panels on their rooftop. That's, that's how good, uh, renewable energy generation is um, in the US, right? How much sense it makes. So anyhow, those are my key points there. Uh, electric cars uh, take care of tailpipe emissions, uh, much lower greenhouse gas emissions, and the fuel electricity is getting cleaner all the time. All of this is not possible with even the best hybrids out there. So I would really push you if you were thinking that I'm, 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 I'm thinking of getting a hybrid versus an electric car, I would really push you towards the electric car. Now, whether you want to get a plug-in hybrid versus an all-electric, that's a different question, and that would require a little more nuance. Yes, Tom, that's a great point. Tom just said that could get cleaner and dirtier, but definitely getting dirtier in the sense that um, where are you going to extract it from? And if you go to places that's more difficult to extract oil from, like the tar sands, uh, it's definitely got to get dirtier. In any case, uh, that's, that's essentially the things I really wanted to touch on the environmental side in terms of pollutions and emissions. Um, do we have other questions before I jump into batteries? Because that's a question that often comes up. Environmental impacts of batteries. Should we, uh, here's, uh, lower, okay, so Elaine's question is about maintenance costs. Yes, Elaine. So uh, the, this is, and this is a good question to just talk about generally, is that uh, electric cars and all electric, especially, they have 
they're much simpler an induction motor um, and uh, a battery uh, they're far less moving parts than a, a gasoline vehicle or a diesel vehicle so firstly the electricity as a fuel is on average about a third the cost of um, gasoline i don't know what the cost i think the what is the cost of gasoline these days like over three dollars right so 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 on average it's a third cheaper the fuel itself but the car itself also does not require much maintenance uh, we've had the leaf for three years now and the tesla for two and a half years uh, there's there's no oil change and and janelle you can speak to that as well you've had the bolt a little longer right how many years have you had the bolt for um i'm trying to think now if it's it's going on perhaps three this will be the third year my my fun story is a year after owning the car i got a little concerned that gosh was there was there some maintenance that i was supposed to do like okay there's no oil changes so i called up the um the person, the person who sold me the car and said, so is there maintenance I need to do? I've been driving my car for a year. Everything seems good. He goes, yeah, very important. You probably need to add windshield wiper fluid now. <laughs> Seriously, other than uh, rotating the tires, that is something right. that you need to do just like with any car. But yeah, I just thought that was so fun. Yeah, that the maintenance was add windshield wiper fluid. <laughs> right. So that's with all electrics. Yeah, uh, sorry, Mark, go ahead. I, <clears throat> I haven't had the Kona very long, but now it's at the point that every time I get into it, it reminds me that in X amount of miles, I have to take the car in to get it uh, checked. Now, you know, if I reach that point and don't do it, is it gonna drive me crazy until I actually do? That Mark, then you just find the setting to turn off the ah, notification. You, you have to tell and, and message Hyundai that you made an all electric car for a reason. It's not a gasoline car <laughs> and you made a good one. So I'm not going to bring it in because I don't have to bring it in. <laughs> right? Because it's like Nissan still sends us coupons come for an oil change. Hey, you sold us an all electric. What are you doing? <laughs> what, why am I getting these coupons? Right? So it's just sort of part of it that is the business model. But Tom brings up an important point. If you go for a plug-in hybrid, and plug-in plug -in hybrids are, I'm sure most of you know, uh, plug-in hybrids are you go for a certain number of miles, all electric, and uh, then they switch to uh, gasoline. And it varies how some of these cars use it. Some stay in the all electric part purely. Others can mix the electricity with the, um, the, the gasoline. They re do require oil changes. So when, when we are touting the benefits of super low maintenance, we're talking about all electrics that have, they do not have an internal combustion engine in them at all. Okay. Um, some, and Tom reminded me, I, I believe somebody had earlier, I, th I think that was Simon had a question about uh, traction on air, traction on snow and ice. Uh, so, and then Tom, feel free to add to this. Uh, mm, that's not a people. Sorry. Uh, uh, Wendy is just saying like, whoa, that's lots of people in there. Yeah, right. Um, uh, so uh, the key thing to me is uh, when I think of snow and traction is I think of tires. Um, though, depending on the situation, some people want all wheel drive as well. I don't, I don't think all wheel drive gets you uh, traction on, on a flat road if you have to brake. All wheel drive doesn't get you anything more than a, a rear wheel drive or a front wheel drive would, you need to have the right tires for that. So I think for most people in most situations, two wheel drive just does fine. I know Subaru has done a fantastic job at selling people on the idea that somehow most people, if just because they live in a place where it snows, they need an all wheel drive. That said, uh, most electric cars right now on the market are um, two wheel drives, either they're front wheel drives or rear wheel drives. Tesla makes uh, all-wheel drives. Volkswagen is coming out. Their ID4 is going to be going to have is going to have an all-wheel drive option. Um, Tom, do you have, remember yeah. any other from? Um, actually, traction's a little bit better with EVs, um, and the reason for that is because they're heavier than comparable gas cars. Right. Um, so, and there are the one other uh, four-wheel drive 
uh, the new uh, Rav4 Prime, which is why my mom got it, um, uh -huh. because she's sold on only EVs. So, they, I mean, you can get four-wheel drive now, um, but yeah, and if you feel you need to, there are there are a few out there now. Right. Uh, okay. And and again, uh, I would I would really because there's a fair difference between let's just just look at Tesla's numbers because those are in my sort of in my head. So you're talking about a Model Three, which is a sedan, forty thousand for a rear wheel drive, and almost ten thousand extra for an all wheel drive. And again, what is that getting you? You could just get a uh, whole set of tires and wheels, put it in your garage if you have one. And, and get snow tires and swap them and you'd get much better traction and you'll save much more money over the uh, life of the car than you would by just getting an all-wheel drive. So that's just how uh, I think about that. Towing capacity, again, I think it, it varies. Uh, most of these sedans like Bolts and Leafs, um, these are not sedans, but they're hatchbacks. There's not much of towing capacity there. The Tesla Model Y has, has a fair amount of towing capacity. I, I believe the Volkswagen does as well. Tom, does the RAV4 does do the same thing with towing? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a little bit, it's going to be a little bit better there. I mean, my RAV4 2012, um, I have a tow bar on it and I have towed. Um, I don't know the, I've never really pushed it, but um, it probably could do 3000. Right. Um, and I know that the new Ford F-150 Lightning is going to have amazing towing capacity. Right. Um, so I mean, really, you have to look at the models. But I mean, if it's a model of a car that you think about towing with an ICE vehicle, you're probably be going to be able to tow a little bit better with an electric version, again, because the vehicle's heavier. Right, right. And uh, uh, Elaine, to answer your question, the Model Y, Tesla Model Y has, has a towing capacity that can uh, easily do that. You all, of course, you'll see a drop in range when you do that. And the Model Y also comes with an option where you can get the tow hitch and everything. Uh, so that's a good one to look at. And it's a hatchback and it's an SUV style. So you get a lot of the, the perks uh, of, of the larger space and everything, plus the towing capacity. Um, of course, that like Tom said, the Ford Lightning is great as well. Um, that should be out soon. Tesla has the very divisive cyber truck. Some people love it. Some people absolutely abhor it. They think it's just, uh, but uh, anyhow, I'm not going to pass any judgment there. Any other question there that I might have missed before I want to make, I make some points about batteries. Okay. Yeah. And feel, please feel free to even unmute yourselves and ask questions. Do you don't have to be quiet through this? Okay. So the, one of the things that comes up and rightly so is what about the batteries, right? Because the batteries do have an environmental impact. Um, any, the way human beings acquire metals is by mining and mining by definition is a destructive process. How we mine has to do with explosions. That's how we mine, right? So um, most of it. So there is, there is of course environmental impacts of that. But um, I want to point to a couple of things as I go along uh, so that we kind of get a whole sense of how the whole battery ecosystem uh, works. So I'm just going to share my notes. And um, again, uh, I think by the end of this, you'll get a better sense of uh, why overall um, electric cars are still the way to go. So, So here, I just want to give you a sense of who's making the most, uh, the biggest lithium ion batteries, like who's the, who's the biggest manufacturer of lithium ion batteries in the world. So you've got LG Chem, um, CATL, which is Chinese, LG Chem is Korean, BYD is Chinese as well, Panasonic is Japanese, and then of course, Tesla is making their own batteries as well. These are the largest produce, battery producers by capacity. Um, LG's batteries are going into um, the Bolts and the Koras of the world. Uh, Hyundai, Kia, GM, they're sourcing their batteries from LG Chem, though GM is saying they're going to make their own batteries now. Uh, CATL um, is making batteries for some of it now for Tesla as well in China. BYD is a huge, huge company that not only produces batteries, but an incredible array of electric vehicles, most of which are in the for the Chinese market, but their buses are exported. Um, 
Panasonic has had a very strategic partnership for, with Tesla from the very beginning uh, for um, battery manufacturing. So that's just a quick snapshot. Now, how do you get the most out of batteries? Like what is, how do you make batteries more environmentally friendly because mining has its problems and we'll look at that uh, just in a few minutes. So the first thing to do is reduce the amount of batteries that you need in cars. And how do you do that? You make cars that are more efficient. Efficiency matters. Tesla is the leader there uh, in terms of vehicle efficiency and uh, the use of, and they use energy very efficiently and Hyundai is a close second. So you make higher efficiency vehicles. If you have higher efficiency vehicles, they use smaller batteries, which requires less raw materials and less energy to run the car. So if you're very particular about that and you can, you have a lifestyle where you can buy a smaller, smaller electric car, I would always push you towards getting a car that's more efficient and has a smaller battery back, period. Um, then after their life in electric cars, most electric car batteries will be reused um, as, as storage batteries. Let me give you some examples of that. this. Um, Nissan has been working on this project in Japan where uh, the tsunami in 12, uh, 2011, it affected parts of Japan. And, and what they're doing there is using these batteries from repurposed batteries from Nissan Leafs. They're all electric vehicle uh, for lighting purposes along with uh, solar panels um, in, this, in this town's recovery efforts. This is Amsterdam, one of their most famous football stadiums they have uh, again a whole energy system ecosystem set up there using used nissan leaf uh, batteries uh, this is this is more on the experimental side but uh, audi has been using batteries from their cars that they have been doing tests on uh, to run again um, on one of their campuses uh, and and to get collect data on this but this is really the future of of a lot of the electric car batteries, they will not end up in landfills. Firstly, they will have a second life as storage batteries where it's a, it's a less exacting life. Uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult life to be in an electric car and they'll have an easier life uh, in, their, in their second life. And then, um, and, and I'll come to recycling in a second, and this supply of used batteries is gonna grow as EV adoption increases. And these are, these, you have to take these numbers with a grain of salt because there's a huge projection there. We're saying anywhere from 112 to 275 gigawatt hours per year of used batteries becoming available by 2030. Now, what does that even mean? How much is that 275 gigawatt hours? Well, that's the 200 times the total energy storage installed in the US in 2018. That's really the scope, the possible scope of the used EV batteries. So that's just fantastic. And of course, when that happens, that not only increases the life of the battery, but it complements renewable energy, like solar and wind, therefore further reduction uh, in fossil fuels. It's a very virtuous, positive feedback loop. I'm gonna skip that section. Then when you're finished, you will get to recycling. And this is where a lot of effort is being put in because we really, batteries have precious uh, materials that we do wanna, recover and it would really be awful if you just threw them away. Now, fossil fuels, remember, are extracted and used any, only once, but lithium ion batteries are recyclable. Um, at least theoretically, most of them, so a, a lot of this is still um, being worked on. But um, if you look at the battery life cycle, this is what it looks like. You mine the raw materials, you produce the battery, you use it in a vehicle, and then you recycle that. Of course, at that point, there's a second life as storage battery. So that's important to remember. And it's the extending the life of battery is really superior both for, for environmental and business reasons. It really makes business sense to recycle batteries and not mine raw materials again. Just wanted to share this example, Yumiko, European giant did already do a lot of recycling of, of lithium ion batteries. Um, they have 50 production sites worldwide. Um, employ more than 11,000 people. The US Department of Energy has been really interested in battery recycling because they realize that this is the future. We really have to have a big presence in this market. 
it's a it, this would be a very strategic geopolitical thing, especially with regards to China. So they they launched the resale resale center uh, in 2019. That was when Trump administration uh, was there, and that's their mission to help grow a globally competitive U.S. recycling industry. And they have few focus areas, and they've made pivotal discoveries in all of that. So it's really fantastic. It's you you're, you're seeing government public money, taxpayer money being funneled into uh, battery research that could help us really become uh, like a global superpower in terms of lithium ion battery recycling, which would be fantastic. Um, LI Cycle is one of the bigger, uh, again, battery recycling, newer startups, uh, and they've developed a process which is very uh, low waste, um, and they can recover up to 80 to 80, 100% of all materials found in lithium ion batteries. They are gonna build um, a recycling hub in Monroe County, New York this year. Uh, I don't know the exact status of that project right now. So I'd have to look up on that and see how much progress have they made, but that's really exciting that that's really happening in New York. Um, of course, there's Redwood Materials. I'm, I'm just throwing a few names out there. Uh, this is created by the co-founder of, by J, uh, J.B. Straubel, the co-founder of Tesla. And again, uh, they are recipients from Amazon's uh, 2 billion climate pledge fund. And again, they, they, they are really looking to, all these companies are really looking to capture uh, the, the recycling market, the lithium ion recycling market. Here's a, another point I wanna stress uh, before, as, before I finish this section. I think when people talk about batteries, they talk about batteries as if they're all the same. Like a lithium ion battery is a lithium ion battery, but it's not, right? Uh, you've got various different chemistries and I'm not gonna go into all of them, but these, these batteries can be really different in terms of their environmental impacts, depending on which becomes most popular. So you've got the last one, the LFPs, the lithium ion phosphate um, batteries. Those are, they don't even uh, contain cobalt and cobalt is one of the more problematic uh, elements in, in batteries. So it's, it's really an important point to remember that battery chemistries are evolving. They will keep evolving the industry is really looking at sustainability because whoever does it most sustainably and with least amount of environmental impact plus like i said it makes business sense to do it this way they're going to win the they're going to win the market i just want to give an example that tesla is already using the cobalt free batteries and uh, that are made in china and these are these cars are now already being exported to europe so that's that's a little bit of the battery background. I know there's a lot of stuff I'm throwing at you there. Um, but I want to stop there because I think I've covered most of the environmental stuff there. I can talk about how mining is being made better uh, and how, how in there exist initiatives to really clean up mining. And it's all very exciting, but I don't want to uh, spend all the time there. I'm happy to take other questions now. Um, okay. So Tom mentioned that I I talk more about the practical parts of uh, owning an electric car. Would that be useful? Yes, no? I think so, because we have a number of people that have said they're interested in buying an electric car. Yes, yes, cool. please. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> so uh, again, and, and feel, folks, because there are a bunch of us who are EV owners here, feel free to jump in and talk about your own experience. I'll start with mine because I'm a renter. Um, and I'm, I'll speak from a renter's perspective and this may not work for you, but it works for me. So uh, very roughly, and I'm gonna put this in the chat as I speak, if you charge uh, an electric car at the regular 120 volt outlet, right? Where you, the same one that you charge your four on, you'd probably get about four miles every hour of charging, four miles of driving every hour of charging. That's a rough number, an average number could be a little better, a little worse. Right, because uh, and people would ask when they I, when people would ask me like where do you charge your car and I used to say very tongue in cheek thinking I'm very smart um, that well wherever you can charge your phone uh, you can charge your car but then our dear friend Dan Gunther who passed away earlier this year he said Samrat you cannot charge an electric car on a train 
And I said, yes, I have to, I have to put the exception in there, right? So that's true. So 120 volt, you get about four miles per hour. If you switch to 240 volts, then it can really, it can vary because again, it depends on how many amps have you set it up with. So again, that's, but I'm gonna give you sort of average numbers. It might be a little less or more depending on, on your setup um, that you get about 25 to 30 miles of charging every hour of driving every hour that you uh, charge. So that's, that's your home, that's what your home setup is gonna look like on AC. Um, and I'm a renter, so I just, we have an outlet there outside, I just plug it in. But I also am able to use a lot of public charging that exists here in, in Ulster County. And uh, thanks to uh, people like New Paul's um, Climate Action Coalition, folks like New Paul's Climate Action Coalition or Gardner Climate Smart, we have all these excellent public charging stations. Homeowners, do you wanna share your experiences about charging? What is it like? I, I can jump in. When we first got our bolt, um, we didn't have the charger yet. So we did just plug it in a exterior outlet uh, for some months while we kind of uh, researched what was the best charger for us to get. So indeed, um, now we charge inside of our, our garage. And what I've really found with the charging, especially if you happen to have a garage or a place that you normally park it that's near an outlet, it's just absolutely no big deal. I mean, you come in, you plug it in. And unlike the, the old gas Subaru we had, inevitably, an, uh oh, I'm gonna be found out because my husband just entered this call. He's, he's not really Patsy Perlman, he's Eric Perlman. <laughs> Gosh darn, who left this car here on empty? <laughs> you know, I, I do, I so don't miss having to go to the gas station and touch those nasty gas pumps and smell like gas. And also it's harder as somehow in our world to, to plan to have a full tank, whereas it's just so easy to have the battery full because I just. What if you forget to plug it in? You know, you get an, well, first of all, chances are it's not on empty unless you really gone somewhere and emptied it out, you know, yeah, you're gonna, it's gonna be in the forefront of your mind. One of the things that I really appreciated when I first got that electric car is that it gives you so much feedback, feedback that you don't get with a gas driven car. And I have found that I am a much more efficient driver um, because it's immediately in your awareness as to um, how much energy I'm using to like put the, put it, put the pedal to the metal and go up a hill. Oh gosh, I better slow down, you know, or I, I find that I ease into stop signs and, and, um, and leave them at a, at a, a much more calm pace and it saves a lot of energy. Gosh, if we all had that feedback back with the gas powered engines, you probably would drive your car more efficiently too. But um, in short, I really, I, I worried about the inconvenience of, oh gosh, am I going to run out of battery or, you know, how, do, how often will I have to charge it? Um, and I have people often ask, well, how long does it take to charge? And that's like, it's such a hard question to answer because it's so rare that I haven't drawn it all the way down. I'm usually just topping it up and then it doesn't take that long. And I don't even pay attention to how long it takes because usually- I'll tell you, Janelle, how long does it take to charge? It takes 30 seconds for you to charge. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because, because it takes you 30 time. seconds to plug in the car. Exactly. That's how long it takes you to charge. Get it and forget it. And then the next time I go to get in the car, magic gets already charged. So I don't right. even really think about how long it takes to charge. So. But Tom, you had a point about getting notifications, right? Yeah, no. So I, I mean, I've never used this feature, but I definitely have a feature on my charger that it says I, to send me a notification if I uh, don't plug the car in at a certain time. I mean, if you so if you have a job and have a regular schedule, you'll get an, your 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 phone. It'll you'll get a note a notice on your phone or your email that says, "Hey, you forgot to plug in." Right. Um, but. I have uh, one thing I would say about charging, if you have a home and you're thinking about getting an EV and you think you'll need level two charging, um, I would suggest getting a 120, uh, 240 volt outlet installed the next time an electrician is at your house. 
um, just because the biggest cost for doing it is um, getting the electrician out there. Um, the outlet I recommend for this is a NEMA 1450, which I just put it in the chat. Um, and almost every EV charger brand has a version that plugs into that. So you have that outlet and then you'll also, you get a charger that plugs into it. You can also take that charger with you and, on a long road trip. And uh, those are the outlets they use at, for RVs at RV parks. So you can also charge at RV park parks if you wanted to. Um, so it's a, that if, if you're getting prepared, if you already have the car like Janelle, um, then you can get a hardwired one but uh, it's kind of nice to have that option. Um, I like the plug-in ones. Right. right. Piece of yeah. advice that I'd throw in there is it's good um, as you're getting ready to buy that car to um, start to become familiar with the apps that you can put on your phone that tell you where um, chargers are. Um, there's a number of different apps and just to get used to using them so that you don't have that panic. You, you're driving home with the, the car and like, oh, where do I charge? Um, and just, you know, start to become familiar with, you know, where some of the even free chargers are, where plug share, some, some just put in the in the chat that that uh, is a common one that's used, but there are many different apps. I wonder, um, Samrat, if you might also talk about why your, in terms of charging, why your advice is if a person is going to do a lot of long distance travel, uh, why they might want to consider the Tesla versus um, another model. I don't think we've talked about that sure. yet. Sure, sure. Wendy, did you have a question before? I, I did, thank you. Um, yeah, now I know very little about electric cars, but I really am thinking about doing it. So, and so it may sound like a stupid question, but um, do they uh, over time lose battery power like a, like a cell phone does? So right. that, you know, like don't keep a charge as long? Right, that's a great question, Mandy. So that's 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 what is called battery degradation. Uh, yeah. So that does happen over time. Uh, but um, thanks for coming, Simon. See you. Uh, so that does happen, but again, it's not going to happen. Most cars, most electric cars, actually all of them, they come with at least eight years and hundred thousand miles of battery warranty. But remember, that warranty does not mean that the battery is going to stop working because just like your phone doesn't stop working or your laptop doesn't stop working, it's going to keep working. What you will see is you're getting lesser miles for the same amount of uh, like charge, right? So essentially, you can't charge it to 100%, so to say. Uh, and that varies from model to model. But uh, with most of the, like some of the best numbers we have are for Teslas. Uh, because they have been driven the most number of miles, and it's very encouraging that uh, in like these cars can be expected to last 300, 400 thousand miles, mm. right? Where it's still usable capacity. Because the, what the battery warranties are saying is that we are guaranteeing you that you would still have, let's say, 70 percent of your capacity after these many years. So I think battery degradation is not something one has to worry about so much. Uh, though, of course, um, you, you clearly see that because, I mean, again, there are the big players are all the big players and they're sort of sharing their technology. So LG, LG is putting LG's batteries are being put in Hyundai's and they're being put in um, GM's cars. So I wouldn't worry about battery de degradation so much, though there are ways to actually take care of your battery a little bit more. So that's something if once you get there, you bought a car, that's something we can discuss. We could maybe have a session for EV owners on how to baby your battery. You don't have to, but you can if you want to. Um, Another question that has come in is, um, can I add a public charging station to my building in New Paltz? Uh -huh. Sorry, what was the question? Um, can I add public charging stations to my building in New Paltz? You can, yes, it's, you can, I mean, if, is, is somebody thinking about doing that? And I, are you? Uh, can that? Hey, Samarat, this is, this is Scott. I'm sorry, thank you. This is iPhone. No, I'm kidding. This is Scott Arnold. <laughs> um, I own Rycor Heating and Air Conditioning in New Paltz. And we've talked about putting public charging stations in front of the building. Uh -huh. um, so folks with electric cars can come up and charge there. And we just didn't know how to go about that. 
I don't see, I don't see, and, and maybe other people can speak to this as well, but I don't see any reason where you want to do that. Why, how, why can anybody stop you, right? You sh are you planning to charge people money for that? Or is that a service that you're doing? No, I, I, well, I guess that's a two part question for you is it, does it cost a lot to offer that service? Um, Cause I don't really have any sense of it, but the second part of that is we were considering moving our, our smaller vehicles to all electric. So we thought we'd maybe install it for that purpose and also to open it up to the community. Uh -huh. So, so th Scott, there, there, there are multiple ways to look at this. I'm just quickly going to talk about cost of electricity. So say if you put a two, uh, a 240 volt uh, charging station there, that's, and again, these, some of these chargers, if you're not looking to network it with anyone, like a networking service, if it's just sort of a standalone charger, uh, 240 volts, 32 amps, then you're talking about in an hour, people could, could get maybe a, a dollar's worth of electricity from you, right? So is that something you want to charge for? You could if you wanted to, no. but maybe you don't, right? No, in, no. And, and you can always monitor if, if there are those people. I mean, if you feel like somebody's abusing that, then that's a conversation you can have with people. Uh, but really, the, the amount of electricity somebody would get from you is not much because it's so cheap so i would say and and tom please feel free to add in yeah. right i i'm i would say put a standalone charger that's not connected to any network because otherwise you would then have to pay the fees like if you go with a company like charge point or anyone now you're paying their fees put a charger there leave it open to the public some people will use it and others won't because most of the time again most people don't need it it's more like it's more a convenience than a necessity. That's how I feel about it. There's, um, there are currently large grants available for businesses that install chargers in public places. So um, Scott, get, to, get in contact with me afterwards. I actually have a whole presentation on that <laughs> for businesses okay. um, uh, in charging, uh, installing chargers. Um, I agree with Samrat, if your business is not in a busy downtown district. If your business is in a busy downtown district where people might be charging a lot, then you probably want to charge them because the numbers really can add up if you're charging, uh, if uh, you know, if people are using it all the time. Um, but uh, the grants uh, are available and they'll actually cover most of your cost of installing this. Wow. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Sam. Yeah. Sure thing. So I'll, I'll put my um, email in the chat and uh, Someone else said they were interested in this. I'll, I'll talk you guys through it. And Scott, I missed the name of your business. Sorry. So what? Uh, this is Scott with Rycor Heating and Air Conditioning. We install. Oh, no, Scott, it's you. You know yes. me. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I Sorry, just don't have a Zoom me. account on this no. phone. No, no. It's, it's, I, no, it was the photo. It's, it's the camera so little. Yeah, of course I know you. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's hey, fantastic, Scott, right. that you're, you're, uh, willing to do that that's that's great well that's yeah. that's our our mission as a company a greener cleaner future that's fantastic wonderful love that um and i love the fact that you're also thinking of an all-electric fleet yeah oh absolutely it's the way to go yeah. that's wonderful excellent um all right uh tom you had a mention about you mentioned the degradation in in your car which car was that the eight percent in that that's my uh rav4 ev that's the one that actually has real mileage on it um uh -huh. The, the Prius Prime, I haven't noticed any, but it probably only has, I think it only has 14, uh, has about 15,000 miles on it. Right, right. And it's harder to notice in a plug-in hybrid. Too. It really is, right, um, right. But, right, but I can like, we have, uh, we, I had a, uh, a Chevy Volt, which is a plug-in hybrid and that has 93,000 miles on it. There is no degradation there, but that's also how Chevy built that. It's some excess battery capacity, so it's a, in most cases, one doesn't have to worry about battery degradation is what I would say. By the time you start seeing a noticeable difference, your, your car, you've been driving that car for 10, 12 years. That's what's going to happen, most likely. Uh, for those um, new to electric cars, too, one thing that I didn't realize until getting it is that with the regenerative braking, they set it up so you don't, when you, you, when you do a full charge, it's not actually all the way to the top full because they want to allow space for you to do regenerative braking. So for example, um, I live on Mountain Rest Road and when I go into town, I'm doing a lot of downhill and some braking. And so my battery actually is more fully charged when I get to town than when I leave my um, garage. So um, 
at first it kind of threw us like, why isn't this filling all the way to the top? Well, it's because it, it's intentionally saving room so I can get that free energy just for going down Mountain Rest Road. Right. And that's another part, thing that goes into the maintenance cost that, um, that you, the fact that electric cars have this ability to turn that their kinetic energy into the electrical energy that's stored in the batteries, uh, it's not getting wasted as the, the thermal energy that's being produced from your brakes, those friction brakes. So you're using less of your friction brakes, which means that over the life of the car, you may change the brakes once if that, so that's, that's just fantastic. That's another thousand bucks right there that, that you, you've just saved at least because of the fact uh, that all electric cars can do that. Um, uh, Janelle, I do want to answer your question about uh, people who travel more. So the, I think it's a key thing to think about when you're buying an electric car as to what your the most average, average case scenario is. Are, is this your primary car in the family or is this a car, this is your secondary car in the family? And if it's, or if it's your only car in the family, right? So if, if again, it depends on your situation, I'm happy to talk more about it i'll put i mean i'll put my information there in the chat and we can we can we can talk more about this afterwards but if you're going to be on the highway a lot uh and lots of drive highway driving and it's your and it's your primary car i would push you and you have the money i would push you towards a tesla it's just a different world with tesla supercharging network you will i mean if you're thinking of an all electric i would push you towards that side because you would have it's 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 just sort of hassle free they've built it uh, but if it's your secondary car or you don't drive around that much, or the only thing that you're concerned about is, oh, every two years I take a road trip, then, then buy the car that uh, is costing you the least amount of money. And if you make a road trip once every two years, then rent a car, right? Car rentals are still available and your fuel savings and maintenance savings will more than enough, like it'd be more than enough to pay for that rental. That's, that's how I think about it but I think it depends on everybody's personal situation. Ooh, new used leasing. Uh, that's again, Jim, a uh, bigger question. New used and leasing. Um, um, I think one has to, here's how, here's how I attack this question, right? Here's how I would attack this question. I put this question more as model responsibility, right? And one can be more pragmatic in answering, answering this question. Uh, and, and maybe Tom can respond to this as well. If you have the money, if you have the money, if you can afford a new car, you should buy a new all electric. That's how I think about this. Because the fact is we have to build up an ecosystem of electric vehicles. We have to create a future market for used electric vehicles. And those people who have the money, if they are looking for bargains right now, we never get to that used electric car market. Right, that's how I look at this. That said, um, if if when if I look at Tesla's, depending on the car, most of the time the used car doesn't make sense to me because uh, they retain their value very well. But you can get good deals on other electric cars like Bolts. Bolts are usually ones that you can get good deals on, though the used market is very hot right now. And if you're thinking of a used EV, I would just say wait and watch and see how this plays out. Uh, Tom, do you want to add to yeah. that? Yeah, uh, um, I agree with Samrat on the point about buying new if you want to change the market, although you can lease too, actually. I think the, yes. those people who lease are the ones who are really uh, make it, bringing, creating new uh, market. Um, on the new versus lease, I would say, are you the type of person who leases a car? Or are you the type of person who buys a car? It's, it's the same decision. There's a little bit more towards leasing an EV because historically the resale values have been relatively low compared to an IC, a, a, a internal combustion vehicle. So um, you hold them a long time, uh, the leases way. Um, on the used side, right now I agree, it's not the best time, um, but it depends on the used car. The used cars that are really expensive right now are the ones that um, car rental agencies want. So if this is your second car and you're looking for something for just bopping around town without a lot of range, one of the first or 
earlier EVs with a limited range, I doubt those are pretty expensive yet because um, those aren't the type you would a um, rental agency would would buy because they would worry about their clients getting stuck. So those have typically always been really cheap. Um, and like a second car or you're buying a car for your son who's going to college and you don't want him to get too far away. I'm really, I think, you know, 60 mile range uh, EV is perfect for him. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, it depends on what you need. Right, right, exactly. Um, Can I ask something about that range question? I might've missed this earlier. But for a battery charge on a non-Tesla car, what mm -hmm. sort of mileage would you get with a full battery? I mean, not it mileage. The, it um, really depends on miles. the model. It really depends on the model. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. But, uh, so you have to research that particular model. Yeah, but, 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 right. but, but it can sue most, most of the new all electrics. Most of the new all electrics are now in the 230, 240, 250 range. Miles. Oh, miles. okay. Yeah, with a full battery. Oh, okay, cool. Right, uh, right, but it varies, but it can vary, and it's a it, that's why it's a personal question. Yeah, and and the old ones though used to be in the high double digits, so fifty to hundred miles, um, and you can buy them used for very cheap now. So if you can get by with a fifty to hundred mile, which is like the one my Rav Four um, was a hundred mile, which was one of the longest range available when it was built, but now it's it's pretty wimpy, but it, it works great because it's not our only car. Right. Okay, thank you. And then, if, I, if I pull into a gas station and want to charge, how long is it going to take me? Okay, so you wouldn't, firstly, uh, Rick, you will not put in a, pull in a gas station because most gas stations don't have chargers. Sorry, I just had to say that. Uh, but yes, if you did, it depends on where you're, again, it depends on the model and it, and it depends on the car, you like the car and the charging station. So this is where you really need to look at what car are you buying, uh, and and what where are you going to charge it. So that that's really a personal question. Like it's hard to answer that question, but I'll give you an average figure, again for whatever it's worth. Like for whatever that's worth, I'm going to give you an average figure that if you had a Tesla, and again this is average. Uh, it can it's usually better than this. I always give conservative estimates. Then under most conditions in 15 minutes, you would get about hundred miles of driving mm. in a Tesla, right? In 15 minutes, you'd get about hundred miles of driving. That's like, I'm me being conservative. Now, when you switch to other cars, it, it's usually lesser, but it doesn't have to be. And that's why it's, it's hard to answer that question. That would require uh, really a personal uh, look at this. And that's, I just want to make a quick pitch, Janelle, because you wanted to say something that uh, Tom and I provide uh, clean energy coaching through the through New Yorkers for clean power. And that's a free service to the community. So that's a link there in the chat. If you, if you really want to go over these very specific personal questions, it'd be great if you just make an appointment with either Tom or me, uh, or through that link, and then we can go over these specific scenarios with you. Janelle? I was just gonna make uh, the comment, especially to Sue who asked the question about uh, the range, is that do note, however, that in the winter, there is a significantly less range. The, 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 the temperature does make a difference. So you, you do need to plan for that. Right, yes. So Sue, yeah, Sue, you can, it can be any like, Again, on average, it could be like a third of the drop in range, especially when it's very cold, right? And again, it depends on how much heat do you use in the car? Does the car come with a heat pump or not? But it's good to think about those things as you're thinking about buying the car. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, anything else that we may or may not have covered? Yeah, I, I've got one, like what if you run the air conditioner and uh, the heater, are you using battery life? Yes, I mean, ba battery life, yeah, you mean the battery capacity? Like, uh, is the charge yes, the charge, the charge, the charge, the charge. Yes, you, yes, it does. Again, depends on the vehicle. What I've noticed is uh, air conditioning definitely in my car, which is a Tesla Model 3, um, is more efficient than heating. And again, that's understandably why it is, because it's the, the temperature difference that it's dealing with is much lesser. So. 
I find air conditioning a much lower, almost to me, it's almost negligible. That's what I think, uh, drain, but the heating can be a, a, a bigger drain on the battery. And I think I mean, what Tom, Tom Conrad just put in the chat is what I was gonna say too, is that the seat heaters and the heated steering wheel are a real boon there. Um, they use um, a less, less of your battery than turning on the blower. So um, I find that makes just a huge difference, just turning on the seat heater and then the steering wheel heater, I don't even need to use the conventional heater. That's a great point. That's a great point. That and and that's why again, when you buy the car, the, a lot a lot of the cars, this is like an additional package, can be called a winter package or a comfort and convenience package. This one is really worth investing in. It's a, just a few hundred dollars, but depending on the car, it may be standard. Like the Kona EV comes with this standard, so if you buy a Kona, all of them have it, uh, and it really it really is is wonderful to have those, definitely. Anything else? There might be a few more questions, but um, before you all leave tonight, I did want to share with you just a, a couple of upcoming uh, dates. Um, we do have our next uh, Climate Smart um, um, meetup is in the form of our monthly book club, which is going to be July 20th this month. And the book is Good Husbandry by uh, Kristen Kimball, and that's actually Dan and Ann uh, Gunther's daughter. So um, people have been telling me they're really enjoying the book. Um, so that you can find on our meetup platform, and it's also in the newsletter. Also wanted to tell you about um, the next uh, Climate Solutions meetup, which is, and it's always, the pattern is always the first uh, Tuesday of the month. So in that case, it'll be August 3rd, and we always meet at six o'clock, and um, this one is by the Hudson Valley Green Team. And the, the green team is made up of SunPower, uh, um, Phone com, uh, Co com Insulation, and New Beginning Windows and Doors. And there are four local companies who are committed to reducing uh, the carbon footprint and fighting climate change. And what they're gonna be doing is kind of a hybrid, live in-person and Zoom meeting. And it's going to be at Rycor's new building um, in New Paltz on Chestnut. So you have the option, um, kind of easing our way back into meeting in person to join us uh, next month, either live or via Zoom. And each company will, will be presenting on their services and products. And they will also be reviewing government incentives to assist homeowners in purchasing the products. So I think it'll be a very interesting meetup. Um, so with that, just wanted to, to let people know that's coming. If anybody um, does not currently receive the New Paltz uh, Climate Smart newsletter, uh, do be sure to send us an email, simply newpaltzclimatesmart at gmail.com. And I'll be sure to add you uh, to our uh, mailing list so that you'll get the newsletter and updates. Um, Janelle, can I say something? Something I've always wanted to say and today is my lucky day. So, so my friend, um, my friends from Cali, I have lots of friends in this room, but uh, two of my special friends are from California. They're in California, but they're, they're in California, but they live here in New Paltz, Eric and Joanna. And I don't know if Keeling reminded you of anything, if the, if the name Keeling reminds you of anything, but Eric's father, Charles Keeling, is the person who started the work at the Mauna Loa Observatory for uh, the CO2 concentration, and that's why it's called the Keeling curve. So I just I just wanted to point that out because Eric is in the room. I thought that was really important. Yeah, and and <laughs> Eric teaches at SUNY New Paltz. He's a forest ecologist, right? Eric, is that uh, yes? That's a good description. Um, so it'd be lovely to I think once to have Eric in the New Paltz Climate Smart whenever he has time, he's on sabbatical right now, to talk about some of those things because he's a wealth of knowledge on that. Oh, trust me, I just jotted that down. I would <laughs> love to have you present on those issues. That would be fantastic. So I, I'll i be tracking you down. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, you can talk now. Okay, yeah, that, that's, that sounds fun. That sounds fun. Excellent. Thanks, Eric. Thank yeah. uh, any, any last questions? Question? All right. I would very much like to thank 
uh, Samra uh, for um, filling all of our questions tonight, presenting, and all of you for participating. Thank you so much. Um, and, uh, Thanks, everyone. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Simrad and Janelle. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Be well. Thank you. It was great. Right. Take care. Good night. Bye. Bye, Matreya. Bye, Samra. Thank, Thank you, Samra. Bye. Thank you all. Bye, Scott. Bye, Samra. Thank you so much. Sure thing. Thanks for coming. Sure. Thank you for the, the education. It was awesome. Of course. My pleasure. Thank He's you. Great. He's great. Bye, Rel. Bye, Lisa. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Rick. Bye, guys. Bye, Scott. See you. Bye-bye.